Welcome to On The Way, a podcast about life, but not just any life. It's about life with Jesus. Why do people follow Jesus and how do they get started? And what difference does following Jesus make in their lives? Before Christians had a name, they were known as people of the way, people who follow Jesus' teachings. People have been on the way for nearly 2,000 years now. During the podcast, we explore the ways that people become followers of Jesus and why and what difference following Jesus makes in their lives. On the Way is produced by The Baptist Standard, a donor-supported provider of news, opinion, and resources for living like Jesus. I'm Eric Black, editor of The Baptist Standard. I'm glad you're with us today. Well, thank you for joining us today. We're here with Ken Camp. Ken is the managing editor for The Baptist Standard, and we work together all week long. So it's it's good to sit down and talk about something other than the daily grind, although we'll probably talk about that a little bit, I suspect. Uh, but Ken, thank you for joining us for an interview. Well, it's my pleasure. It's a little odd being the one answering questions instead of asking them, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I bet I bet that's true. Well, I'll let you uh, reserve judgment as to how good of an interviewer I am. <laughs> yeah, no comment. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, the podcast on the way is focuses on a couple of questions. One is uh, how do you become? How did you become a follower of Christ? And uh, the second is how does being a follower of Christ? What difference does that make in your life? And so, uh, Ken, we'll just jump in with that. How did you become a follower of Christ? Well, I really don't have any dramatic road to Damascus kind of conversion experience to talk about, and thanks be to God for that. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home, and I can honestly say I cannot remember a time when I was unaware that God is great, God is good, and that Jesus loves me. Mm. So it was pretty natural uh, at age six for me to uh, walk the aisle at Lamar Baptist Church in Greenville, Texas, and uh, express my desire to follow Jesus. I didn't fully understand what that meant at the time, um, and I, in retrospect, had no business being baptized at that Mm. point uh, because it did cause a bit of angst later on when I became an adolescent and started thinking back on that and questioning the commitment. Uh, And so at age 15, I settled all that and was baptized as a believer at that point. Uh, But I still look back on that experience as a six-year-old as an important first step in my faith journey. So you said at, at 15, you reconciled some of the, the questions that you had and were baptized. Uh, describe what some of those uh, questions were that, um, or, or issues that you needed to reconcile. Well, the church that I attended at that time was one of those that put a lot of stock in saying that you needed to be able to point to the day and the hour mm. when, when you... Uh, became born again, and uh, the older I got, the less that day and hour was clear to me. Uh, okay. So yep. that was part of it. And uh, and then I think also uh, the fact that as I grew in my understanding of what it meant to be a Christian, I recognized the implications of that a lot more than I did as a six-year-old child. And so I, I really felt the need to to make that kind of a, a mature commitment and uh, a public expression of it. Well, from that point, it wasn't too long after that, and you headed off to college. Right. And somewhere in there, you decided you wanted to go into what? Well, when I was in high school, I became involved in journalism. I uh, was the editor of the high school paper. I wrote a column about high school news for our local newspaper. Uh, The summer after I graduated from high school, I went to work at the newspaper part-time on the sports desk in the evenings. And after all of that, I started college with the firm determination that was not what I wanted to do for a living. Ah, okay. 
So I started the college with the firm intention of getting a good liberal arts education, a double major in English and history, and then going off to law school. But early on at college, I was at the Baptist Student Union one day. Mm. The BSU offered a free lunch one day a week that volunteers from churches in the area prepared for students. And I've never been one to turn down a free home cooked meal. So that day, the speaker was from the Southern Baptist Foreign Mission Board. He was talking about the need on the mission field for a lot of different vocations, some of the particular skills that were needed. And one of the things that he mentioned was journalism. And it's not like I had any call to foreign missions at that point, because I, I did not. But I did have a very clear sense that God was kind of tapping me on the shoulder and saying, that's what you need to be doing. Uh -huh. And so I changed my second major from history to journalism and uh, went ahead and pursued that. Uh, and what school was that? Uh, that was at East Texas State University okay. in commerce. Yeah. All right. And um, wasn't sure really what to do after that, but I figured it's not going to hurt to go to seminary. Uh, so I, uh, I enrolled in Southwestern Seminary and looking at the catalog at that point, uh, saw a few writing courses in the School of Religious Education. So I, that's what I initially sent, signed up for got there and found out that the communications program had just started. It wasn't published in the catalog yet, but they had just begun offering a communications degree. So I took that as affirmation that that's probably where I needed to be. All right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, while I was there, one of the requirements for the, uh, the master's degree in communications was field experience. At this time, that was when the Radio and Television Commission was located in uh, Fort Worth. They were just starting what was then called the Axe Network. Okay. And I think they were just really looking for free labor. Uh, so they were hiring a lot of interns. Okay, uh, yes. Program, and I had absolutely no interest in that. Mm. I did not want to have anything to do with radio and television. That's just, that's not what I was felt called to do. And so I uh, began to look at other places. I contacted the Baptist Standard. Okay. Uh, President Wood actually spoke in one of the classes I was attending, and I talked to him, asked him if they had any kind of an internship, and he said no. So <laughs> I thought, well, okay, uh, where do I go now? And I really wasn't sure how I was going to fulfill that requirement. But while I was in seminary, uh, my grandmother uh down in deep east texas uh had gone to the hospital and so on a friday afternoon i left fort worth about noon drove down to marshall uh and while i was visiting granny in the hospital in marshall uh it so happened that my aunt's pastor was also visiting her he was the pastor of a little methodist church about 10 or 15 miles okay. uh, outside of Marshall. Mm -hmm. Got to talking, uh, told him I was a seminary student and what I wanted to do, what I felt like God was calling me to do once I got out of school. And he said, huh, you ought to call my brother, uh, Orville Scott. He's the news director for the Baptist General Convention of Texas. Uh -huh. so, so I immediately came home, contacted Orville Scott, did an internship at the VGCT communications office that summer. The following summer graduated from seminary and the next week started work at the VGCT and worked there for 19 years before coming to the standard. Wow. And you've been at the standard now for about 16 and a half, uh, not quite 16 and a half, but yeah. a little over 16 years. Yeah. So it turns out that journalism did become your career. Yeah. As a matter of fact. Yeah. Well, and can and I cannot imagine doing anything else now. Ah, uh, it's been, okay, it's been, it's been such a joy and such so fulfilling. Oh, tell tell me more about that. When you say it's been so fulfilling, I get to tell the stories of what God is doing through His people. Ah. I get to tell the stories about how people are being obedient to Christ's call and the difference that it's making, and that is absolutely delightful. There's nothing better. Mm. 
So w- in addition to getting to tell those stories, you're also creating a record for generations to come. Well, I guess that is true, yeah. Uh, yeah. Providing some kind of a, a a background for those to come, to, to look back and say, this is what this generation was doing. So, yeah. Yeah, because that's one thing about journalism is we're not just uh, putting things out there today that are relevant today, but uh, because it's in print or now it's... Uh, online, presumably it's it's available widely for a long time to come, that these stories outlive us. And that's really the story of Christian faith in general. That is true. Yeah. yeah. Tell me one of uh, the stories that sticks out in your mind from those early days working for the BGCT. One of the areas that I have always enjoyed covering is Texas Baptist men. Uh, uh-huh. uh, and I started work at the BGCT in 1984. In September of 1985, that's when a major earthquake hit Mexico City. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I went down to uh, Mexico City with the first team of Texas Baptist men that went in. And that was an absolutely incredible experience. Uh, it was the first night out. I spent in a cab of a truck with John Lanou, who was one of the pioneers in Baptist disaster relief, and was just asking him why he was doing this, uh, how he got involved in it, and what his motivation was. Back before the what would Jesus do fad Mm -hmm. a few years ago, (laughs) uh, one of the books that was really significant uh, in my life early on was uh, Charles Sheldon's book, uh, In His Steps, yes, mm-hmm. uh, which was all about the question, what would Jesus do? And that really became uh, a guiding principle for me, which then led to another, well, I, if you're going to do what Jesus would do, it's kind of important to know what Jesus did do. Yes, yes. And, uh, and, and so that's really why I have just tried to stay immersed in the Mm. Gospels uh, ever since. Well, getting back to the conversation with John Lanou, I asked him, why are you doing this? And he said, because we need to do what Jesus did. Uh. And he said, Jesus really did two things. He met needs where he found them, and he showed people the Father. And I thought, okay, that is worth telling the story for right there. If if pe- if Texas Baptist men really are demonstrating to people this is who God is and this is what God wants for you, then that's a story mm. I want to tell. And so it's it's just been a joy being uh, able to cover them ever since. Uh, one particular incident uh, in 1991, there was a cholera epidemic in Peru. And uh, as it turned out, they were desperate for medical supplies, for prescription medication, for anything that could be used to try to stem the tide of that plague that was going through Peru. And uh, early on, Texas Baptist men worked in partnership with Baylor Hospital in Dallas to provide an initial shipment of IV medication to go down to Peru. That went well. And so as it turned out, Texas Baptist men made contact with the Pentagon who offered them a military cargo plane to take a whole load of of hospital equipment and medical supplies down to Peru. But it they really didn't have a plain load of <laughs> things to donate at that point. And so as, you know, as I was covering that and uh, learning more about it, I was talking with a, a colleague uh, there in the same department where I worked at the Baptist building. The area where I was covering one of many was Texas Baptist men. One of the areas he was responsible for was what was then called the Human Welfare Coordinating Board which was all of the hospitals and all of the children's children's home and family ministries 
that Texas Baptist helped to support. Uh, so I was telling Terry about this, and he said, all of the presidents of all of the Baptist hospitals in Texas are here in the building today uh, meeting with the director of the Human Welfare Coordinating Board. So I said, you call Dwayne Martin. I'm going to call Bob Dixon. All right. <laughs> so, so we did. Uh, and Bob went. He spoke to the group and was all said and done. Uh, they ended up making $4 million worth of medical supplies and prescription medication and other uh, needed items uh, possible for Peru. So they more than filled a, uh, a cargo plane. That's incredible. Yeah, sometimes uh, we get accused, I say we, those of us in, in the news and media uh, industry field, we get accused of making the news, sort of making things happen so we have stories to tell. And I, I guess there is some precedent for that. Uh, some guy from San Francisco, I think, uh, Hearst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but th this is a story, an example in which, uh, well, I, I guess it is true that sometimes we're in a place where we can connect resources, and and yeah. yeah. So you yes. got to be in a place and time when you got to do that. Yeah, it's it's really fun when God lets you be a matchmaker, mm. uh, when you get to help make the connections. Um, and it, it, it was just an open door. Uh, and there have been other times like that. There was another occasion where uh, I got a call out of the blue from a farmer up in the panhandle that had, heavens, I don't even remember how much, but it was potatoes they needed to get rid of. And I'm not altogether sure, but I think it was the kind of thing where he... He couldn't put them on the market, and I'm not even sure that he could donate them domestically at okay. that point uh, because it would affect the right. market price and all that. That many potatoes. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, because it, 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 it was a okay. bunch of potatoes. Again, I don't remember, but it was, it was tons. And uh, so he said, is, is there anybody that can use those? And I said, I have no idea, but let me find out. And I called Texas Baptist men. And that was just about the time that the uh, famine in North Korea mm, was really okay. taking off. And they had an open window where they could go in and help provide some. Through another connection, they then con they made contact with breed love dehydration up in the panhandle that was able to take the potatoes from that farmer, uh, mix them with other things and put it in a, the kind of packaging that could then be sent over to Korea and uh, used very effectively. So mm. again, it was just one of those situations where God just opened up the door and uh, I was just happy to be able to have some small part in making connections. Yeah. We're going to take a 60 second sponsor break and we'll be right back. High Ground Advisors has a 90 year history of providing investment management and planned giving solutions to churches, faith-based organizations, and charitably minded individuals dedicated to transforming lives. High Ground is trusted by over 450 nonprofit clients and we're one of them. High Ground has partnered with Baptist Standard for over 70 years by offering a comprehensive charitable giving and investment solutions model, which includes asset management, planned giving education and development, account support services, real estate and minerals management, and expert legal consultation. High Ground and the Baptist Standard share similar values, such as serving those who are called and dedicated to transforming lives and being a trusted caretaker of legacies. They also value good stewardship, helping those who desire to be good stewards of their financial resources to find creative giving solutions to fulfill that calling. They know what they do to protect, strengthen, and grow our mission is ultimately in service to the gospel. To learn more about how High Ground Advisors can partner with you or your organization, visit their website at highgroundadvisors.org. 
when you put a story together, how do you bring uh, your commitment to Christ into the way that you put a story together? Well, I think in part, it's the way that we approach people uh, when we're interviewing them, when we're reporting on what they say or do, uh, recognizing that it's not just about getting a story. Mm -hmm. It's about, uh, it's about the people involved and, uh, being true to what it is that not only what they say, but also to reflect something of the you know, enough of the context so that it's not yeah. misunderstood what yeah. they're saying and, and just trying to be, well, I mean, just trying to observe the golden rule when we're reporting uh, and, and being honest about it. So that's a big part of it, I think. Uh, and then uh, looking for those ways where we can tell those God stories, the, 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 the incidents where uh, people are obviously being used mm. by God. And it's, it's not just about them. It's about the fact that they were yeah. available. So it sounds like, and I guess I'm uh, speaking for myself too, in what little uh, reporting I've done, that we have layers uh, to a story. There's, there's the news layer, there's the human layer, but then for us at the Baptist Standard, but as, as Christians in the media, we have a, a layer that's really foundational to all of that for us, and that is, what is God doing here? I think as um, Christian reporters, we have a responsibility that all reporters have to the truth. We maybe just recognize it a little more deeply since Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, that kind of means it's an important thing. Uh, so, so honesty in reporting is of utmost importance. I also think, though, um, because of the, the audience we're reaching, because of the kinds of things we're reporting, we have a distinctive opportunity to, to tell the rest of the story that maybe it's not being picked up anywhere else, to tell uh, some of the stories about people that aren't maybe heard uh, by anyone else. Uh, to look at a, a side of an event beyond what people are just going to get on network TV news or looking at the daily newspaper or going online or whatever. Uh, I think that we're able to tell, uh, tell more about the why uh, people are involved in helping their neighbors, uh, the why that people are willing to... Um, to give without any expectation of receiving, uh, that we're able to tell those kind of stories because we understand that motivation. Yeah, we, uh, we've had a couple of weeks, well, longer than that, actually, of, of stories that have been, uh, we've spent a lot of time on, you've spent quite a bit of time on, and right now the overwhelming story for all of media is coronavirus and what's happening with that. And uh, we have those that say that uh, coronavirus is really being um, sort of stirred up by the media. They just, they're making us afraid. And there's, a, there's pushback, once again, against the media in, in light of this. How do you respond to that? Not the same way that I would have a week ago, because um, a week ago, maybe a little bit more than a week ago. I heard that a lot. I heard mm. a lot of people who were saying that this is just the media. They're advancing their agenda. They are trying to get somebody elected or they're trying to uh, stir up, stir the pot so that they can get higher ratings or draw more subscribers or whatever it is. Uh, and, and it was, there was a lot of blame being pointed um, directed toward uh, the media at that point, but I'm hearing an awful lot less of that now. Um, I think that there's a, a lot more coming together uh, in mm -hmm. the past few days than there had been previously. I think there's a greater awareness of just how serious it is. Uh, there's yeah. 
and it's hitting close to home now. It's no it's longer very close to home. It's no longer something that is overseas or mm -hmm. or just on the west coast or even just in Dallas proper. I mean, we, right. we had our first case in in Garland now. Uh, and so it's getting really close to home and that's waking a lot of people up. And I think that the good side of that is a lot of people are recognizing that the things that were pulling them apart a week ago, that um, some of the things that were uh, gaining their uh, allegiance that were um, claiming their attention just really don't matter that much now. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're all kind of in the same boat. We're all kind of stuck in the same four walls. Well, not the same four walls, each of us, our <laughs> own individual <laughs> four walls. Uh, <laughs> but we're all, but we're all in the same situation. And there's, there's something unifying about that. Uh, it's, that's the irony of all this, that at the same time that we are having to distance ourselves physically, there's also a sense that we're all kind of in this together. And yeah. maybe that's, maybe there's going to be some good that comes out of that. Well, you sound optimistic. I'm trying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you admit it's, um, it's something that at this time in the situation that we find ourselves is not natural. It's not a natural optimism. It's Oh, absolutely not. It's yeah. not. And yet it's also an opportunity. Um, hmm. My oldest son is my pastor, as you know. Okay. And yes. uh, Sunday, by the end of the day, he was absolutely exhausted. Mm -hmm. All of the decisions that were having to be made, yeah. all of the, the weight of those decisions was really weighing heavy on his shoulders. Yes. And he was, he was beat by the end of the day Sunday. By Monday afternoon, he said he was energized oh. because by that time, the decision was made. And, oh, well, and, yeah. and now it was, okay, where do we go next? How do we do this? How can we be the church when we're, we're not together? How, yeah. how can we continue to minister when we don't have those one-to-one, face-to-face kind of connections that we had the opportunity for previously? Uh, how can we be the body of Christ in this context? Um, and that's calling for a lot of creativity. And, um, and I, I've been proud of how he's responded to that. And, and I've been proud of how a lot of churches have. They're demonstrating a lot, of, uh, a lot of creativity in the way that they are reaching out to people and the way that they are uh, seeking to minister in, in their context and adapt to situations on the fly because it's changing every day. Um, the restrictions that were in place last Friday had changed by Sunday night, uh, right. here in the Dallas yeah. area particularly. And, and then by Monday, it was even more intense, but because it's so different, it's forcing us to think outside the box. It's forcing us to do some things that, uh, we wouldn't have chosen to do, but now we've got the opportunity and we can run with it. Yeah. And, in the middle of all of this coverage, it, I've noticed the same thing that you have, that up to this point, maybe a, a day or two ago, there was all of this, uh, there were stories that, if we weren't careful, could make us feel afraid uh, or certainly stir some fear. And all of a sudden, what I've noticed, and maybe it's just because of what I follow, I don't know, but there's this turn to more... Uh, well, energizing kinds of stories, more hopeful kind of stories. Uh, yes, this is still serious. Nobody's making light of any of it. Uh, but because we're all in this together and it is serious, it's almost like we can bracket that out to an, to an extent and then really turn our attention to uh, doing something really productive, getting back to who we really are and being about that. Yeah. 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 And it's just filled with challenges when we have always placed 
such an emphasis on being the gathered church, mm-hmm. and now we can't gather. We've always talked about the importance of the ministry of presence, and now we're discovering the ministry of distance, and yeah. that's that's, that's a, a real shift for us. It's a it's uh, it's difficult for us to wrap our heads around, but at the same time, it's kind of exciting. Yeah, yeah, and and what what is the church going to look like when when we get to the other side of this and we can start coming back together? And we don't know when that's going to be, but how are we going to be changed by this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it will be fascinating to see. Uh, it's scary, obviously, uh, yeah. because we don't know what changes right. this is going to bring. Uh, we don't know how people are going to choose to respond in terms of financially supporting the churches. Mm-hmm. And we don't know how they will be able to financially respond, given what this is doing to the economy. Right. right. Uh, so it's scary times. But yeah. in the midst of that, uh, when we look at the opportunities, uh, that is that's energizing. That is exciting. And that gives us an opportunity to, uh, to do things differently than we ever thought we would do them. Yeah. Cause the it's, rules don't count anymore. No. Well, you know, and we've had those conversations about the rules for a few years now, but in particular in relation to the Baptist standard, as long as I have been uh, connected to the standard that it's, it's almost like, uh, the rules in, in every field, are being rewritten. They've been in flux for a while, especially with journalism. And uh, well, that, that's been sort of an ongoing conversation related to subscriptions and online access to news and, and those kinds of things. So as you, because you have a, a longer view of journalism than I do, as you sit back and you look at what's happening right now, and based on your past experience, and maybe try to project a little, this is crazy, I know, but uh, project a little bit into the future. And what do you see as a possibility for journalism uh, in the midst of this and, and on the other side of this? Yeah, I wish I had. I, the, I won't hold you to it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wish I had the luxury of <laughs> sitting back and thinking about this. I'm, I'm peddling as fast right, as exactly. I can. Uh, but I, I do think that part of what's coming out of this is some of those who have been bashing the news, um, particularly in recent days and recent years, uh, are recognizing just how vitally important it is. Uh, Mm. We've got to stay informed in these times. Now, at the same time, I think people are recognizing just how toxic it is to stay tuned into that 24 hours a day. Yes. Uh, yes. And how depressing and soul crushing that can be if you're just addicted to it and, and doing right. nothing but looking at that. Um, I mean, I have to follow a lot more than I probably would choose to. <laughs> right. All, all, things, yeah. all things being equal. Uh, but even now, uh, I'm finding myself looking at videos that pastors have posted and uh, those kinds of things that three weeks ago I didn't bother looking at. I didn't mm. I didn't take the time because mm. because there were more pressing things. Yeah. Well, now that is kind of the most pressing thing. And that's rejuvenating to be focusing mm. on those rather than on a lot of the more divisive uh, topics right now. Yeah. Well, as we come to the end of, of our conversation, I, I have to say that I am very glad I get to work with you, and I'm glad that you are on the way with Christ. And at a time like this, I'm thankful that the Baptist Standard and Texas Baptists and, and those who have been reading you for a long time have someone like you dedicated to Christ and uh, to those principles, the Golden Rule, for example, and um, 
and with your heart to be writing the news and um, editing the news and publishing the news at a time like this. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and I, I appreciate your leadership. Just because a person follows Jesus doesn't mean that person is perfect. Following Jesus is a lifetime of growing more like Him. Likewise, while there are followers who are more mature than others, who have spent more time growing close to Jesus than other followers, there are no followers of Jesus who are better than others. If you aren't on the way with Jesus, we invite you to check out the Follow Jesus page on the Baptist Standard website at baptiststandard.com forward slash follow Jesus to learn more about becoming a follower of Him. If you are on the way with Jesus, we hope that this podcast has encouraged you to grow more like Him. The On The Way podcast is produced by The Baptist Standard, a donor-supported provider of news, opinion, and resources for living like Jesus. To make a donation, visit baptiststandard.com forward slash donate. To receive the Baptist Standard weekly newsletter, visit baptiststandard.com and click on the subscribe button. I'm Eric Black, editor of The Baptist Standard, and I'm glad you've been with us today.